Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining. This is the inaugural first ever SIGGRAPH Education Committee Symposium on Innovation, Research, and Experiences in Education, something we affectionately call Soiree. Our hope is that this is going to be something that we do a couple times a year, always virtually, always free, as a forum for educators that are focused on the computer graphics and interaction space to exchange ideas and share their work, work in progress even. This is intended by design from the, the committee that was putting this together to be a dynamic free flowing type of event. It's not, it's deliberately not intended to be something where it's just presentation after presentation after presentation. So each one of the sessions that we've put together has a number of panelists and they'll be presenting either a quick video, something we call a fast forward. Each video is generally about one minute long um, or they might be presenting a five minute talk in all cases, these are just meant as teasers for the discussion that'll follow. So each of the discussions are going to occupy the majority of each session uh, to fill out the hour. And that'll be between a host and the panelists. And we certainly invite questions from the audience as well. So uh, before I pass the baton here, I just want to say thank you so much to everyone involved in the SIGGRAPH Educators Committee. Uh, you are the ones who made this possible through your support and effort. There is a long list of names that I'm going to, in the interest of time, not go through at the moment. When we uh, package all of these and post them to the SIGGRAPH Educators Committee's uh, YouTube channel, we'll make sure everybody's name is listed in those. But I'd really like to move on to our keynote presentation and our keynote panelists. Our panelists are the three individuals who have received the Distinguished Educator Award from SIGGRAPH. And no uh, better person is here to uh, Host, then Glenn Goldman himself. Glenn has been on the committee involved in uh, deciding who has been receiving these Distinguished Educator Awards and uh, is actually the originator of the idea to have those awards in the first place. Um, and he will be hosting this panel that features Don Greenberg and Andy Van Dam and Barbara Mon Monez. Uh, Glenn, it is uh, your forum now. Thank you, Nick. And uh, I, I will mention one name of uh, who's had a lot to do with this. Uh, and nobody's done more really for this than Nick uh, and as part of the Education Committee. And it's been uh, terrific. The Education Committee, by the way, is, is a year long committee of educators. And uh, we hope that you become interested in what we do. And you can always reach out and contact me if you're interested. We have a variety of different programs and you'll be hearing about some of these throughout uh, the day. The first session is going to be um, an extraordinary treat. Uh, we have the first three ACM SIGGRAPH Distinguished Educators or recipients of the ACM SIGGRAPH Distinguished Educator Awards. Uh, they are all extraordinary. Their uh, accomplishments are at this point legendary. Uh, they are all still active in the field. They are all still active in SIGGRAPH and uh, they, I just, my role here is to, once I introduce them, is to try to literally step in the shadows and let them speak. Um, they will each make short presentations and then pretty much talk about what they're interested in, in terms of education, research, technology. So the first is going to, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce them all, but the first one we'll speak will be Andy Van Dam, who was our initial recipient of the uh, ACM a SIGGRAPH Distinguished Educator Award. He joined Brown in 1965, where he became the founding chair of the Computer Science Department in 1979. He was their inaugural vice president of research in the early 2000s. He's taught computer graphics continuously from 1966 to 2018, co-authored initially with Jim Foley in 1983 and subsequent editions with John Hughes, Steve Feiner, and Morgan McGuire of field-defining textbooks in computer graphics. He is one of the co-founders of uh, ACM SIGGRAPH, uh, or SIGGRAPH, I should say, the precursor to SIGGRAPH, and I'm not pronouncing it well, and uh, then with his uh, IBM sponsor, Sam Matza in 1968. 
Um, people have referred to his textbook as the Bible of computer graphics. Uh, that makes Andy God, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe not, but he certainly is um, an extraordinary uh, educator and I am thrilled that he's here today. Uh, last year's uh, distinguished educator, now the other one, and the next one is Barbara Moans, who's been working to develop uh, innovative applications in the areas of computer graphics and animation in academia and industry for, for more than 40 years. Uh, she's designed and implemented training programs in the areas of digital modeling, uh, animation, technical direction, 3D painted DreamWorks, PDI, and ILM. She's worked for the White House and uh, NASA, and she worked on Al Gore's GLOBE, the Global Learning and Observations to Benefit the Environment Program, uh, which was a project whose mission was to connect children from all over the world through the internet to study satellite imagery and learn about the ecological impact uh, of soil and water use, and she received uh, the NASA Group Achievement Award for that. Uh, since 1999 now, she's been a faculty member at the Paul G. Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering, directing interdisciplinary animation capstone teams at the University of Washington, um, working in virtual reality and augmented reality. Uh, films that have come out of her classes have gotten local, national, international awards. Um, she became the first director of the reality studio at the University of Washington and taken on an international leadership role both at, ICM, at ACM Seagraph and IEEE uh, with regard to assessing uh, potential of AR and VR technologies for curriculum development. She is also currently um, a member of the Seagraph Executive Committee and a member of the uh, Education Committee. So uh, someone with whom I interact almost on a weekly or more than weekly basis <laughs> these days. And the last person I want to introduce is a friend of mine who I have known, I realized at least since 1995 was, I think the first time I met him at Seagraph, maybe earlier, definitely by that is that's Don Greenberg, who's a Jacob Gould Sherman University professor of computer graphics. Uh, he's a director of the Cornell University program of computer graphics, the founding director of the National Science and Technology Center for Computer Graphics and Scientific Visualization. He's a professor of architecture, art, engineering, and computer science. And uh, I guess one of the reasons I, I've gotten to know him is that like me, he's one of the few architects who is uh, who are members of uh, ACM Seagraph. We, are, uh, we have another one I know speaking this afternoon later, Taro Narahara is also an architect. Um, he's been working this since 1966, researching and teaching in the field of computer graphics, using this techniques in a variety of disciplines. Um, he's taught in computer science, computer aided design and engineering and architecture, computer animation, art and technologies and strategy in the business school. So he works with computer science, he works with designers, he works with architects, he works with uh, business students. He's currently conducting research in VR and AR for real rendering and is developing new tools for all these different disciplines um, that we speak about. And all three of these people have, uh, there are a lot of people who are educators and a lot of people who do a lot of things in education. I will tell you on the committee that, that, that you know, judged for these awards, what impressed us in all three of them is that they have, in spite of their innovations and everything they've done, they have maintained their primary commitment to education and to students. And for that, uh, they deserve our, they certainly have my utmost respect and admiration. Um, they are all up on the pantheon of heroes and educators from my perspective. And I, I just wanted to sort of go in the corner and listen to what they have to say and I, again, I want to thank Andy, Barbara, and Don for taking time out. Some of you, for some of you, it's very early. I uh, uh, you know Barbara's out on the West Coast. I actually, no, I think Andy's probably on the East Coast. Don and I are on the East Coast. So, but, and every, and all of you can be coming from a variety of places. But again, thank you. And we'll start with Andy and then Barbara and then Don. And then what I hope will be a very free flowing, interesting discussion. Well, thanks very much, Glenn, for that very generous introduction. Also, thanks to Nick and the other folks on the Education Committee for hosting us this morning. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I've been doing in graphics education. Uh, I have been teaching a simple form of 2D graphics and animation event handling 
in my intro course to 350 people using Java and JavaFX. So I start with people who've never programmed before, teaching them the beginnings of what shapes are, what widgets are, what a timeline is, and how you manage event handling. I've also taught the real 3D graphics course for many decades, as you heard. And uh, in that, I taught the foundations, which includes the basic linear algebra of how we move shapes around, uh, some notions of meshing, uh, simplifications to the rendering equations, starting with all the well-known uh, approximations that came out of Utah in the uh, late 60s and early 70s. And uh, I think the hallmark of both of these courses for me has been that they're project oriented. So I know that when you lecture, you communicate some ideas and the students somewhat get them, but the real learning, as we all know, takes place during the hands-on practice. So I teach computer science students and some physics and engineering students as well. And I want them to get their hands dirty in both of these courses. So uh, there are sequences of increasingly more complicated programming assignments that they do uh, in the graphics course over the last decade. They have all learned how to do shader programming. So they all get their hands on the GPU and uh, produce final group projects, typically two to three people in a topic of their choosing. Uh, it's modeling cityscapes or fractal trees or fluid flow, uh, whatever they like. There are a bunch of compulsories that they have to do and the rest is free form. And I've always been impressed by the amount they managed to learn in a semester. I would have had trouble with it myself. A couple of things that I think are really important to point out about teaching computer graphics, as is obvious from both Barbara and, and Don's backgrounds and ways they come at the problem. It isn't just a subject in computer science, it's very multidisciplinary and multidimensional. And that's one of the things that has always appealed to me. So part of what I did in the computer graphics course was to provide a bit of contextualization by sneaking in bits of art history. The obvious thing is the development of linear perspective during the Renaissance and how that revolutionized the art of call the social impact for art and our technologies. Visualization. And I'm very pleased by uh, the fact that our the other thing that I have developed put increasing emphasis in socially on responsive is a different form of contextualization, uh, which you could call there are the, many the social impact for this of our technology technology. But we and want to make sure that students that the recognize that, that it isn't just about has algorithms and data structures and socially responsive and other technical graph. aspects of uh, our craft. Of there our are science. many, uh, but also this because it is very much concerned technology. with humans. But and we want to make sure that students recognize that we think about both the algorithms and data structures and, and, and other technical aspects. So in computer graphics, it's very natural. But also about, because uh, it is very much photography and with AMX humans and their usage of uh, deep fakes that we think about and both the positive watermarking and negative and potential subjects that really situate. So in computer graphics, progress very we made natural to talk about in the larger photography of how it fits in with both positive uh, and deep negative fakes and issues in watermarking uh, the way we advance subjects that really situate society. The progress. So I urge all educators to think in about the larger however they come of the field, how it fits in with both the positive from negative science perspective and applications in, uh, in the way we or our design civilization and our the society. denominator for all. So of these I urge all educators to think about however they come at the field of computer graphics, uh, awareness from a computer science perspective, or and with that I'll turn or an art design perspective. The next speaker. The denominator for all of these different perspectives should at least 
include a bit of Barbara, socially responsible uh, awareness creation. And with that, I'll turn the podium over to the next speaker. First, I, I wanna thank uh, Glenn and Nick for putting this together and, um, and to thank my colleagues. I'm extremely honored to be uh, in your presence. Um, and I wanna talk um, about the education soiree. And so part of a soiree is a dance. So I wanna talk a little bit about this dance um, that I've been actually involved with for many, many years where <clears throat> technologies emerge and I get excited about them, I get involved with them. Um, and I, as Andy was saying, we all come at this from a different perspective and I use technologies in ways maybe they weren't intended and that helps evolve the technology and then it starts all over again. So um, it's a very exciting dance for me and um, I'm gonna share with you today one project. Um, and and uh, I'm talking about a little bit about technologies in search of a purpose because I come from, um, my perspective originally is from uh, the art environment and I worked in industry um, as Glenn mentioned and um, also uh, I'm an educator. And so, uh, I work in a school of computer science and engineering, uh, which in itself um, should indicate how interdisciplinary this field is and how we all can contribute our own perspective and help each other. Today, I wanted to actually just go over a project that I've been working on for a couple of years. Uh, and it evolved from an interest that I, um, that I got excited about when I first moved to Pacific Northwest. I uh, got to know the, uh, the animals, the wild animals in this environment. And uh, for, for, for maybe five or six years, I've been involved with um, working with my students and integrating uh, that work with researchers at the University of Washington and um, using the technologies to support uh, the idea of developing empathy for these animals and then sharing that information with the layperson. And so this uh, project that I'm gonna be presenting uh, to you today uh, evolved from originally an idea, um, an in integration with um, crows and their behavior and then otters and then orcas in the environment. And this one um, is, uh, is about, uh, our interest in um, an octopus, a specific octopus named Eleanor. Um, but uh, in addition, uh, we have um, developed both a film and a VR experience. And so the goals are actually to create an experience that allows the participant to actually embody an octopus. So to be an octopus. And you've heard that adage, um, walk a mile in my shoes in order to be able to understand how my experience, uh, how I experience um, my world. So the idea is to actually promote empathy and understanding by allowing a human to become an octopus. I work with a student group that's interdisciplinary. And then eventually we'd like to educate the public about the octopuses. So this is actually based on a real life uh, uh, octopus named Eleanor. We actually were able to go to the basement of the psychology building in the University of Washington and meet five octopuses that were living there temporarily and then released to the public. I mean, to the back to the uh, Puget Sound. Um, so why octopuses? Well, they are really, they evolved in a completely separate way to humans. They have nine brains, eight arms, three hearts. Uh, they have, are incredibly intelligent and um, have unusually complex behaviors. They are very different than we are. Their bodies um, move more like our tongue. Um, and uh, so we've been trying to develop ways of mapping that motion onto a human in a meaningful way that will, that will enable a, a human to really feel what it's like to as much as possible to empathize with the animal. So having eight arms, uh, an unusual experience. This is the character rig that we developed, and it's based on a it's 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 a based on a realistic um, a version of an octopus. It's rigged in a very complex way, um, and it functions, uh, which is um, very exciting. And that built uh, that actually segued into um, 
both a film and a VR experience. So this is actually a little clip from the film, Eleanor, which came before the VR experience. I wanted to say a little bit about narratives and films because this is a significant way to actually develop empathy with your character. Uh, this is also Eleanor, but it's not the same as actually being the character. It's a very different experience. And so um, that's what we've been working on. Um, and in order to do that, we actually worked with a, with a researcher, Dominic Civitilli. On the upper left, you'll see this is the real sense data from a real octopus. On the right is the video from the real octopus. On the bottom uh, right is the um, point cloud from that octopus, and it's applied to the R model. So we go from real to R model in this, uh, in this diagram. And, um, and then from there, we added some physics to the model. And, um, and then we, um, here is the experience. Uh, let me give you a little context. So um, <clears throat> this is um, Terrell Strong, who's actually driving the VR equipment and uh, experience. This is part two of the experience, which um, assumes that you've already actually gone through the tutorial for um, onboarding into being an octopus. Um, we've organized it so that there is a diver and an octopus and you are the octopus. Um, the diver actually does what, what human beings do well. The octopus does what an octopus does well, but you have to figure out what that is. So we're at the bottom of the ocean and um, there is a boat that you'll see at the top. There are objects that are falling from that boat um, and you need to put the objects in the cra crab pot and uh, return them. So uh, this is, again, this is, um, uh, this is trail driving it. You'll see there are eight arms. You can turn all the way around. You can control all the arms, which is what he's doing. You can also swim. Um, and so the octopus is actually um, uh, going to be, there's the boat with the object, which is a typewriter falling from the surface. There are a bunch of man-made things that shouldn't be there. So the octopus can come uh, up and actually um, get the typewriter and uh, pull it into the crab um, crab pot. Now an octopus can't push anything because it has no skeleton. So, um, so that it can only pull. So that's something that as an octopus, you need to actually figure out how to move to accomplish this task. Um, and uh, we're going to see the octopus uh, actually say hi to the diver. And then um, Octopuses are very intelligent and very curious, so uh, it would be attracted to something like a flashlight, and they are also capable of fine motor movement, and they could easily push a button to turn on um, a light and turn it off, whether they do it intentionally or not. We will take advantage of that as we continue to work on this project so that uh, we can turn the lights off and turn the flashlight on um, as an octopus. So you are embodying this octopus. and. Um, trying to take the flashlight and put it into the crab pot to return it. And uh, the other thing that an octopus is really good at is finding things in crevices that we couldn't possibly reach and understanding that they can reach inside to that object. They can find it without seeing it. There are, uh, the suckers provide all kinds of information. And so we have a little block there that the octopus is actually pulling back out. There's also a block actually among the sea anemones here. Octopuses um, uh, have a problem with sea anemones. They're poisonous and they could kill them. Uh, so we have uh, the uh, you as an octopus learning that you can't actually uh, touch the sea anemones, which means that in that case, you can't pick up that um, block. And the last thing is really exciting, which is we're allowing you as an octopus to experience what it's like to camouflage to this rock, um, which is pretty special. And then uh, saying goodbye with all of your arms to the, uh, to our diver that also says goodbye to you. So that's the experience uh, so far of part two. This is actually an example of a student uh, feedback on what it's like to be in this environment, even though he's created it. And he's actually pointing out that the diver is really hovering pretty close and it's kind of claustrophobic. And so if you're the octopus and you're looking up, it's a little creepy. Um, we wanna kind of utilize that idea in a way to make you feel like you're an octopus, but we also don't want to have it go through the whole experience because it, in fact, would be creepy. So future goals are kind of to showcase this to uh, to the public by way of any of these um, aquarium the in the Port Townsend uh, Marine Science Center. Um, I want to make one last comment. 
Um, and that is, and it's a bit out there, and I'm gonna actually share this. This is not my idea. This is Tom Furness's idea, who is uh, was the inspiration for a lot of this work. Um, and uh, as you may know, many of you may know that he is considered the grandfather of VR. Um, and he mentioned something very early on that I thought was incredibly intriguing, which is um, that at the very end of this process, what we're doing now is we're actually taking the data uh, that we've discovered from the, um, we went from the real octopus to our model, and now we're gonna go back from our model to the real data and see how close we are. Um, other than the fact that there's a huge uncanny valley problem with this, um, there is the potential in some cases maybe to not only just embody the animal, but to also maybe communicate as that embodied person in the animal with that animal. And so it's something I will leave you with because I probably will never get there, but I think it's an exciting idea in terms of um, uh, thinking about empathy, uh, building empathy between humans and the animals around us and helping them out when they experience trauma, especially as, as a result of uh, our behavior. So I will um, leave it there and I will turn it over to Don. First, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to be on this panel with my younger colleagues. It's probably the last time that I can talk to both of you as my younger colleagues. Um, but what I really want to do is thank the SIGGRAPH organization, and thus partially Andy for starting this, because when I started teaching in 1965 and 1966, uh, I wanted to draw things with a computer based on some previous experience. But from 1974 on, SIGGRAPH has been my academic home. And my academic home because it cuts across so many different disciplines. And I've learned so much from every conference which I have gone to, which is all but one of them since its beginning. And I am forever indebted, and I hope SIGGRAPH continues and continues with new topics and new areas so it can influence education for the future. Having said that, I, there are only three things that I really want to talk about. Or actually, that's not true. I, I'm not used to talking for less than 55 minutes at minimum. But uh, the first is exponential growth. The second is what my, uh, the breadth of what we are doing. And the third is what I'm currently doing now. So with exponential growth next, then I wanna show how I got started. And by very good fortune, I had a close friend who I met as a freshman in college, Rod Ruzolo, who was up at General Electric in Syracuse, New York in 1965. And they were training the astronauts how to dock the lunar landing vehicle with the Apollo mother spacecraft. And after visiting them, it changed my life. And here's an example of what we were able to do in real time. It's 64 polygons, provided that we could compute the colors before. And we see the Apollo uh, landing craft and the lunar land, uh, the Apollo mothership and the and the landing craft that we were able to do in real time, and this led to all sorts of proposals and interest and the ability to to attract the mavericks who were someplace between designers and artists and people who could understand the beginnings of computer science. Next, that. Uh, this is the 11th commandment for me, Moore's Law. And I won't go through all the math except to say that every five years, we get about 10 times the amount of power. So in 15 years, if we had assumed uh, 18 months transitions to the next level of technology, we get a thousand times the power that we had 15 years ago. And teaching this for now almost 60 years, we have a thousand times a thousand times a thousand times a thousand. And so I'm looking at someplace close to a hundred 
billion times more power than we first started. And it's not only that, it's cheaper. Everybody can get good boards in terms of their uh, laptops or play games. And so what do we do when we have 10 to the 11th or 10 to the 12th times as much power? And why hasn't the way we have requirements for education in most areas changed the same way the computer technology has changed? And of course, I'd love to change lots of requirements in lots of different disciplines. But I guess one of the quotes I might get known for, at least at Cornell, is that changing a curriculum in a department is a little more difficult than moving a graveyard. And so we have to depend on SIGGRAPH to be able to do this next. So Moore's Lair, despite all of the predictions and everyone my age or close to it are embarrassed what we predicted 30 years ago with SIGGRAPH because we so underestimated what would happen in the future that uh, one day we should just build up the quotes that may have been taken in the 70s and 80s and 90s of what was there. And I love the epitaph of reports of my death are greatly exaggerated. Next. And when I first bought my 16K of ferrite core memories for my PDP 1140, which was actually an 1145, it was made up of ferret iron cores to store a bit of information and cost $32,000, 16K, next slide. We now have, in my first VAX 11780, we had, it took five cycles to do a computation. So it was a 1 million uh, cycles per second at five megahertz. And it was the first one MIP machine. And now we have really, 10 to the 10th or 10 to the 11th times as much power as that was. Next slide. And we can get this in the equivalent of an NVIDIA RTX or 3090, which is not quite that much, but it is in the tens or hundreds of million, million uh, instructions per second. Next slide. So, uh, next slide. So it's a hundred million times more power than the VAX 11780 in 77, next. And what I like to show is two years ago at one of the display conferences, this was the NVIDIA booth. And it shows, in fact, the gymnast on the left with a video watching the gymnast perform his acrobatics. It was then mimicked by the astronaut on the moon's surface with a real uh, geometric model of the lunar landing vehicle in real time simulation. And to see the combination of this compared to the 64 polygons when I got started is absolutely amazing and it's still changing my life. Next slide. So what am I doing now? Well, when I started in computer graphics and I uh, had a lot of people who fortunately came to Cornell and taught me lots of information, uh, we were mostly involved with either modeling for CAD for the engineering school or rendering to make photorealist images which were physically accurate and perceptually indistinguishable from real world scenes. And I think we've accomplished that. We see this in the entertainment industry, which was then most popular in SIGGRAPH in the 70s and 80s and 90s, and probably still is the dominant part of a lot of the presentations there. 
But the future is different. And the future starts to involve a digital twin. Professor Gelertner at Yale in 1963 started to predict a digital twin. But let me, for the audience who may not understand what that is completely, is today we would really be making a digital model and a digital simulation of how that model would behave. And ultimately, after we think we had the design of the toaster or the television set or the automobile correctly, we would build very carefully some number of prototypes, 10, 20, 30 prototypes, and test to see how the prototypes worked before we start to manufacture the product. And what's important here is after you've had the digital object as shown by the blue box on the right-hand side, we build this physical object and test it. And if it didn't work, we wanted to have the feedback go back to the digital design and modify it until it worked correctly, looked proper, had the right user interface, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a digital twin. And G NASA and JPL and others have been doing this now. They do it for entire automobiles. They do it for entire automobile factories. They do it for such things as the uh, shipping plants that Amazon has for not only the whole plant for Amazon, but also the people in the plant. And since somehow during my uh, uh, not so straightforward educational path, I wanted to do both design and engineering and be able to test the parametric studies that we should be doing at the earliest phases of design. And historically, we didn't do this because we didn't have enough information. We didn't have enough computer power to run the parametric studies. It costs too much. And the technology of computing, despite how good it was, was not fast enough. It would take months to sometimes run the simulations like the energy study of a complex building. So how do we do this now, starting with a sketch? And so I'm back to my roots. And I want to sketch things because it's the easiest tool to use to draw, not a mouse, but to draw with a pen and pencil on tracing paper in non-iterative fashion with ideas based on our history or experience. And how can we take information like that and start to build a digital twin? Next slide. To illustrate this, I love the uh, Magritte painting, which is a bit cynical, which really says in French, I am not a pipe. And what he means is I am a picture. I am a painting, I am an illustration, but you cannot smoke me. And how do we change this to teach for the next century of students when it's so difficult to change the curriculum requirements and allow them to understand what computation can do when uh, you start off your college career taking those courses as a freshman and a sophomore. So right now I am trying to build the digital twins for the design of the architectural engineering construction environments because our infrastructure needs buildings. I'm concerned about the urban poor and housing. I'm concerned about global warming and the way we're destroying our planet and how do we ask the questions so that we can design to satisfy those answers? And more importantly, from a technical point of view, I hope SIGGRAPH in the future will start to ask the questions 
how do you design a digital twin for a design which has not yet been formulated in entirety and a building which has not yet been built? And that's a challenging project to be able to do, but it has to be physically correct and perceptually indistinguishable and then operate the way the simulations thinks it should behave. So with that, I am not uh, diplomatic enough to know how to do this within a university setting. Although I hope with the cor courage and ability to try new things that SIGGRAPH has, we will do this in the future. And the next time I give a talk, either at a university or at SIGGRAPH, next slide, I am going to buy my descent collar. And of course, this is Ruth Bader Ginsburg's descent collar. When she was asked to write the opinion of those dissents that she did not agree with, and in a much more diplomatic way, which I hope I can learn from. And by the way, she was a very close friend of mine and her husband was my mentor when I was a freshman at Cornell. The dissent by her uh, quotation is that the dissenters hope it is that they are writing not for today, but for tomorrow. And with that, I guess I'm ending the session for questions. And thank you, Sigra, for allowing me to be part of you for 40 or 50 plus years and for what we're doing today. And I wish you all good luck. Thank you.